Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorial series on vector calculus for electromagnetism. This is video number 40, and I'm going to discuss part 1 of the Dirac Delta Function. I'd like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstories.com, and if you'd like to find out news or updates on my posts, you can follow me on Twitter at AdamBT503. So this will be part 1 of uh, two videos. I'm going to give a reference video, by the way, so or we'll say a reference site, the CAN Academy. Okay, so uh, Mr. Khan has quite a good video, and I think it's it's worth looking at. But um, we'll see, we'll, we'll see. Maybe maybe you'll understand what's going on after this. So the delta function is something which is seen all over physics, and in lots of different different places, and all over mathematics. So it's very important, and in many respects, it's very mysterious. And I certainly spent many hours as, a, as an undergraduate trying to, to work it out. So I'm going to try and explain my understanding, at the very least, of. Uh, the Dirac delta function. First I'd like to try and motivate it. And let's say we have a function and I'm going to start by thinking about let's say electronics or if you go into a lab and you're looking at circuits and you're trying to look at your what your circuit is doing on an oscilloscope. So let's say for example you have a function which is constant in time. So y is going to be we'll say whatever value let's say x for so long as your time exists. So it's between negative and positive infinity. And I'm sure at some stage you might have seen a, a step function as well. So a step function is something which is off for lots of time, then suddenly turns on, and then it's on for the rest of time. So we define this is a step, of course, for obvious reasons. So we'll say that we, we, the way we define a step is that y is equal to 0 for t less than 0, but y is equal to, say, let's say, x for t greater than or equal to 0. Simple. Now, what happens if we, you know, we want we have a new function which kind of turns on, it's off for a long time, then it turns on, it's on for a short period of time, and then it turns back off and stays like that for the rest of the rest of time. So this is not it's not quite an impulse, but it's 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 approaching an impulse. Okay, so here we would define it as follows: we'd have y is equal to zero for t less than zero as per last. The last definition we have y is equal to x. Excuse me, y is equal to x. So long that uh, the time is between zero and a. So I'm going to define a here and zero here. This, by the way, is at zero as well. And finally, um, we would have y is equal to zero for t greater than a. So okay, right. I'm sure you can understand that. And you can see where we're going next. So let's say now we have a function which is off for a long time, then it shoots up, it's on, 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 and kind of dies away and goes away. So this is this is a, an impulse. Okay, this is an impulse function. So here, uh, for y is equal to zero, or at t less than zero, but y is equal to say, let's say for argument's sake, it's a hundred x. So it would have been x up to now. We're saying it's much bigger than than it has been in the past. And here it would have been when t is greater than or equal to 0, but less than or equal to, we'll say, a over 100. So my point is this time after shrinking it down, so this is a over 100, this is 0, this is 0, and this might be 100x, 100, 100 you know, for argument's sake. And finally, we can kind of generalize this, I'm sure you can see, to an actual impulse, which or the, not an actual impulse, the theoretical impulse, which is, is as follows. It looks like that if you were to draw it, and it would be at y for y, y would be zero for t less than zero, and it for t greater than zero. Excuse me, and and t greater than zero for both of them, right? But at the origin, uh, y would be let's say a hundred x again, but it would be only at t is equal to zero. So it only exists at the origin. It's kind of a strange thing. Now, obviously, we try and this is. You know, re re in reality, this is the closest we'll ever get to an impulse. This this kind of thing can't exist for lots of reasons, okay? Because it, it doesn't exist in time. Like it's at t is equal to zero, it has it has no duration. I suppose you could say that. So I'm just trying to motivate something that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as we could approach the origin. Now I'm sure if at least you're studying physics, you'll have seen Gaussian functions in the past. So a Gaussian looks something like this, okay? You'll have to excuse my my drawing as normal. It's terrible, but a Gaussian fu function usually has the form, uh, it usually has e to the minus m, you know, x squared over y squared or whatever. 
But if you take the limit, if you start to shrink it down, if you start to shrink it down, you can see that it's going to eventually uh, approach this impulse. So let's say, for example, we define, we can define our impulse y of t as follows. It could be the limit as sigma approaches zero of the following function, and this is our this is our Gaussian. So we'll say we have this kind of normalization factor, one over uh, root two pi sigma. And we've sorry, the squares of root two pi and then sigma. And then we have our Gaussian function e to the minus say t squared over twice sigma squared. So don't mind, you know, let the general form is e to the minus x squared over y squared for a Gaussian. So we can see that this function, as you take the limit, we'll say as sigma goes to zero, and sigma goes, excuse me, goes to zero, not is zero, it's going to approach something that does that. Okay, our step, our, our excuse me, our impulse function. All right, so I, I'm hoping you're, you're following me. Um, I'm hoping one of these at least will resonate with you and say, yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. All right, because there are lots of different ways of looking at this. And finally, uh, in terms of motivation, what about a, a limit of triangles? The, a limit of, we'll say, triangles. So let's say each triangle, uh, we have height n, uh, excuse me, height equals n and uh, uh, width width is inversely proportional to n. So n is just some sort of an integer. So if we will say plot this function, it would look, you know, these are these, this series of functions. Say there's one, there's two, there's three. Uh, let's say that's one, let's say that's minus one, minus half, um, I don't know, this kind of, this kind of minus one third, whatever. Okay, there's a half, there is, I don't know, let's say that's, that's plus a third. So this function would look as follows. If you draw the first one, we would have our triangle doing that. If we draw our next one, it'll be from, it'll be doing this. And if we draw our last one, we'll say in this case, we're going, we're doing this. So we see this one is also approaching. In the limits, this one also approaches our, our impulse. And you can see it there drawn in blue as our impulse. All right, so I'm, I'm hoping you've seen at least some of these before. You can accept that some functions have a limit which they kind of approach a massive value at the, at the origin, but they don't really exist anyplace else except the origin. So I'm going to define without, without proof the following. I'm going to define the delta function, so it's the Greek letter delta, and I'm going to say it's a function of t. And its definition is as follows. It's zero, and it's zero when t is not equal to zero. In other words, when, t, when you're not at the origin, the delta function is equal to zero but it has a, a value of infinity at t is equal to zero. All right? And you just have to accept that for the moment because it, it is without proof. And I'll, I'll give you a motivation for it perhaps in video number two. So that is the defini definition of it. But however, it integrates, and this is very important, it integrates, it integrates to unity or it integrates to one. So if we integrate it across all space, delta of t, dt, we're going to get 1. So this is a strange function. It, it's, it's 0 everywhere, except at the origin, where it is, it will say, it's, it's infinity, or it, it like you can't really define that, that value. However, it integrates to a finite number, and this is very important. So its value is infinity at the origin, 0 everywhere else, but its, int in, its integral is a finite number. Okay, so it's infinite height, but finite area. So another way of drawing, we'll say, the, the delta function, or kind of visualizing it as follows, okay? This time I'm going to go from, uh, no, actually, I'm going to keep the variable t for the moment. So let's, let's imagine it does something like this. Just, this is, I know it doesn't really do this, but this is, we're imagining, imagining that we can blow it up a small bit. So this would be delta of t. This, the whole, uh, the area here is equal to 1. And this might be the t-axis like that, okay? And that might be the y-axis. y is equal to delta of t, for example. Okay, so we say here this, this might be our delta function, all right? But the thing is, it's not actually a function because, of course, the width is supposed to be zero. I know I've drawn it with a finite width, but it's, it's not supposed to have a width. It's supposed to be here or whatever. It's supposed to be a small, it, it's small, small, small. It's supposed to be have a width of zero. So we can't really call it a function, so what we actually call it is a distribution. But that's more for the mathematicians. Physicists, I suppose, just kind of just uh, 
uh, assume these things and just go with the flow and let the mathematicians worry about the, uh, the validity of the assumptions. But anyway, that's not, not trying to knock the mathematicians, but I'm looking at it as the point, in the point of view of a physicist. Anyway, what we do next is we make another assumption. We assume it is continuous. Okay, so that's a very important uh, reason for lots, or assumption for lots of reasons. So if we can do that, by the way, sorry, we assume it's continuous, and you may have seen the Kronecker delta function, which, so you might say, delta mn. So the Kronecker del delta function can be thought of as the discrete version of the delta function, or you can consider the delta function as the continuous version of the Kronecker delta. But uh, it, perhaps you can think about it that way. Okay, so if you've seen the Kronecker delta function, just think it's for dis discrete variables, and the de Dirac is delta function is for continuous variables. So, anyway, look at this. If we multiply a function, let's say f of x, so I'm going to change to x rather than t, and we multiply our delta function by it, well, the value is going to be as follows. It's going to be f at evaluated 0 multiplied by delta x. Why is that? Well, let's say f of x, this function here has value, non-zero values, all, all over space. But this one has, has zero values all over space except at one point, at, at, at the origin. So it will essentially pick out the value of the function at the origin. So you get f of 0, and that's just going to give you f at 0. All right? So the point is, this function here is 0, zero everywhere except at x is equal to 0. So the delta function, when you multiply your delta function by any other one, it will pick out the value of your function at f of x is equal to 0. All right? Now, um, just, to, just to rewrite that, that means if we integrate... Let's say uh, that's, that's incorrect. If we integrate as follows, so f of x times delta of x uh, dx is equal to f of 0, integrated again, delta x dx is equal to f of 0, because of course this is equal to 1. Alright, so that's what we get. Now, and the the, there is one more thing I'd like to show you, a very important property of the Dirac delta function, and it's called the sifting property. Not shifting, it's sifting. I don't, I'm actually not too sure why they call it sifting rather than shifting. You, Anyway, but look, it, it's, it's irrelevant really why it's called that. But essentially what we do is we move our spike. We move our spike from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to a. All right. So what we get is as follows: that delta of x minus a is as follows. It's zero or infinity. Of course, is normal, but it's when x is not not equal to a, when x is equal to a. All right. So we just have to we're after shifting it. Now, um, okay, that is that. But we so shifting. You can see why I think it's. I wonder why it's called the sifting property. But what we what we see here, of course, is that the integral. The integral, once again, is going to be of delta x minus a is clearly going to be equal to 1. Now, the reason it's useful is as follows. If we then multiply our function f of x by the, the, the sifted or shifted delta function, or if you multiply f of x by our shifted delta function, I suppose maybe you might say it sifts out the function f of a, delta x minus a. So that's, that's the same. Okay, now, um, okay, now why, so just, and just write the, the integral, so I suppose it picks out the value of f of a, so we can rewrite this as follows, so f of x, delta x minus a, dx, o equals f of a. Can you see that? Yes, you can. Okay, now, finally, uh, just finally, very, a very important property of the sifting property itself is as follows. You can actually, you can shift the variable on f or on delta. Because if you think about it, let's say if we had f of x uh, multiplied by the delta function, the shifted delta function, but that's going to be f of, you know, you know we found that it was f of a. But similarly, if we do this, if we evaluate f at a and instead multiply by, oh, sorry, that's incorrect. If we, if we do this instead, if 
we instead shift the function multiplied by delta of a, what we're going to get is f of a. Okay, so that's all I've got to say about that so far. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might visit universityphysicstorials.com.